everyone for coming out. Uh, my name is Scott, and I'll be talking today about practical responsive typography. But before we get too deep into the practical and responsive part, let's just talk about typography. What is it, and uh, what can we do with it? So typography uh, is really, well, words are how we communicate, and typography is the voice that we give to written words. So let's look at some examples. Here are a number of Hallmark cards, and these are largely hand-lettered. Uh, they evoke something very personal, uh, homemade, uh, and if you are giving one of these cards to uh, a friend or a loved one, uh, these do a really great job of uh, transferring that message to that friend or loved one. Similarly, at protests, you rarely see a printed sign. You rarely see a font uh, from, uh, that is digital. You see something that is from each individual. People are adding their particular voice to this group. And then if you have a newspaper, uh, this is from an institution. Uh, this newspaper rep represents that institution and its legacy. And so the typography tends to be a little bit more uh, conservative, structured. Uh, it uh, needs to instill trust in whoever is reading it and trust uh, that reflects upon that institution. At an airport, you need to know where you're going. You need to know when you need to be there. And so the typography directs you to those places. And with typography, you're looking for a voice that's appropriate for its context. Typography also has utility. There's this uh, painting by, uh, by Magritte, and it's a painting of a pipe, but this painting is not itself a pipe. You cannot take this painting and smoke it. <laughs> uh, it exists as an image of a pipe. Uh, but what's also interesting is there is text below this image. And this text provides utility. It says, this is not a pipe. And no matter how many times you replicate this image of that text, the text is still text, and it serves its original utility. It serves its original function. And the utility of typography is legibility. So a lot of us work with code. This is some CSS. And this CSS is set with a sans serif typeface. A lot of us use monospace typefaces, and this really helps with the legibility for that use case. So here is that same code with a monospace typeface. And the legibility has improved with the typographic treatment. The same can be said with uh, numerals as you're setting stuff, stuff up for uh, sort of lining up prices. You might want the commas to line up so that you can quickly see what the values are and how they relate to other values. And how we do that is there are there's a numeric style called tabular numerals, and it's similar to uh, monospace type typefaces. It is essentially monospace numerals that are intended for tabular data. It also comes in, uh, to, legibility also comes into play when you think about the forms of the letters and the technology uh, that is used to print those letters. So this is an N from Bell Centennial. And you can see that there are some strange things happening within the, uh, the uh, insets of this N. And what these are called are they're called ink traps. So Bell Centennial was designed to be printed very small on very kind of uh, rough, not very good paper. And what these ink traps do is as you print, they fill in with ink and they form a crisp N. This is uh, an example of Century Expanded that uh, typographer Nick Sherman put together 
to showcase uh, how the metal text changed design across sizes. So when people were printing with metal text, with, with metal fonts, those fonts could only be printed at that particular size. So uh, four point century, four point metal stamp essentially, would always be uh, a slightly coarser, a slightly more expanded design, whereas 72 point would be a, lo a little bit more uh, detailed, condensed design. And this design is inherent to the size that it is printed at. You can see this today when you're using a typeface. Different typefaces are, are designed for specific sizes. So on the left here, uh, this is, all of this is in the Freight family. Uh, but on the left, you'll see Freight Micro used as the headline. And on the right, you'll see Freight Display used as the headline. On the left, you'll see uh, Freight Display used as the text. And on the right, you'll see Freight Micro used as the text. And what you want is something a little bit closer towards the uh, text on the right. So the typography, the optical size, is the correct uh, optical size for its use case. So let's get back into the practical and responsive part of this presentation. And talk a little bit about variable fonts. So variable fonts allow us to have this flexibility within the typeface itself. So just as you saw with Century Expanded, there was sort of a gradation of design changes. We can have a gradation of design changes just baked into the typeface. So this is obviously by Ono Typeco. And I can change all of these properties as I want to. The, so whatever works for the design that, uh, that I need it for. And variable fonts have buy-in from pretty much every major company. Uh, this is an excerpt from Microsoft's uh, variable font demo. And they're kind of, they built this to show, showcase that uh, their support for variable fonts. San Francisco, Apple's new typeface is a variable font. So if you use a Mac, you see variable fonts every single day, and you use them every single day. Uh, the Nielsen Norman Group did a study on variable fonts. Should we use them? Are they good? Uh, do they cause any problems? And they worked out so well that they use it on their website. They use variable fonts on their website. And they're fairly conservative to new things, so I think that is really saying something. And typeface designers design variable fonts for us as responsive web designers. So this is a slide from uh, typeface designer David Jonathan Ross. Uh, he gave this talk at FontStand. And he was talking over this slide about how these variations would change fluidly as our screen sizes change. And this is an ex excerpt from uh, Frank Schmero's talk uh, called The Grain of the Web. And it shows the differences between fluid media and text. So variable fonts might solve some of this. We could create fluid text to complement our fluid media. But in this example, it shows how text has this fixed volume. As we make it smaller, then it needs to expand somewhere. As we make it wider, then it sort of expands to fill the space. Uh, but this volume doesn't change. This volume of the text doesn't change. It needs to flow somewhere. So how do we make this better? With fluid typography. So with fluid typography, we want to balance the font size and line length. As line length grows, so should line height. And we want to have a consistent type scale or type hierarchy. So, start at the top. <laughs> uh, Robert Brinker says that anything from 
45, 45 to 75 characters is a satisfactory line length. So this is not that. <laughs> uh, Wikipedia is not very legible in wider sizes. Uh, and then this is a really good example uh, that I think really works really well. Uh, excellent article, by the way. But you can see this line length is capped. It's uh, a lot easier to read as you're kind of like reading across. Uh, it, it breaks in a reasonable way and you can uh, parse it pretty well. An easy way to cap line length is with a max width of this example is 60 characters. Uh, so the CH unit is the width of the zero within that typeface. So it's just an easy way to do it. And let me show you an example. So here's a relatively unsettled page. Uh, this is in a uh, web app that I built with Sal, who's in the room today. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of like a typography playground for fluid typography. So let me cap the max width at 60CH. So now that follows Robert Brinker's rule. And it's not going to expand past that point. Next up, there's font size. So as we get really small, let's say to like the size of a watch, our text, we can, we sometimes have one, two, maybe three words per line. This line length is very, very short. And so we might want to make the text size a little bit smaller to compensate for that in terms of legibility. At a wider size, we have a lot more room. So we might want the font size to be a little bit bigger. So ideally what we would want, say a font size of 100. just make it look, make the line lengths look correct for that size. And as you go up to around the size of a phone, can start to scale it back up again. Line height is something else that you should watch out for as you're transitioning screen sizes. So the line height here feels very condensed. It feels tight. And the line height here feels a little bit better, but it's consistent across these screen sizes. And generally, if with line height, you want the uh, line height to grow as the line length grows. So let's just change these two values to something more appropriate. Great. And now we can see the line length feels right feels loose enough here, while also being a little bit tighter here as the line length changes. Typographic hierarchy is a little bit more nuanced, but we want to sort of create some structure that is maintained across these different screen sizes. In these examples, you can see that the headlines on these cards are bigger than the meta, the meta information, so like bylines, dates, uh, and labels. There's a zoom in, zoomed in version of that. And how you might manage that is with uh, some sort of type scale. So this is modular scale, it's uh, another tool, uh, Tim Brown. Adobe and I uh, built this together. So on a smaller screen, you're not going to have as much space uh, to have big text. So on a smaller uh, on a smaller size screen, you might reduce the ratio between your text size and your headlines. 
as you get more space on your screen, you can start to increase this ratio between your text size and your headlines. And if you use a modular scale, this relationship can be preserved across these different devices. The modular scale isn't the, or size isn't the only way to distinguish a hierarchy within your typographic system. Here, uh, for this uh, website for this coffee shop, uh, you'll see that the menu has these large labels on it, coffee, tea, uh, breakfast, sandwiches, salads, sides, etc. These are the same size as the name of the restaurant. But Middle Child is distinguished in another way. It's older, it's a different color. And so that type of hierarchy works in those different situations. So what tools do we have for responsive typography? We have media queries. And here's an example from the outline where they change the type size. You can see as this scales down, the headlines get a little bit smaller. That ratio between the the smaller text and the larger text uh, changes. But these changes happen very abruptly. So to solve that, uh, Mike Ruffer Miller uh, in 2015, I believe, came out with a uh, formula called CSS locks. Tim Brown later coined the term CSS locks. And that formula looks, looks look, that formula looks like this. So what this is, is it's 12 pixels at a minimum and 24 pixels as a maximum. And then constrained within the bounds of a 400 pixels wide viewport and an 800 pixels wide viewport. Which looks really complicated. <laughs> Uh, so what that is basically doing is it's adding a, uh, it has a fixed font size with the addition of a fluid font size on top of that. So with a viewport width modifier. So to build that again, let's start with 12 pixels and then add that to the difference of the minimum and maximum font size. Modify that with the viewport unit, and that's going to be huge. So we need to bring that back into the bounds of uh, the viewports that we want to target. And how that works is like this. So you can see as I transition screen sizes, the text gets a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller. If I change one of the values here, so let's drop this down to 20 pixels. As I make this smaller, it drops down to 20 pixels. Pretty soon, uh, this just got drafted. Uh, this is clamp, and it allows you to transition between uh, two fixed sizes with a variable font size, so <laughs> uh, three viewport widths in this case. So this is a minimum and a maximum built into a CSS function. And this is going to be a lot more performant and a lot easier to write than that equation that I showed you before. The difficulty with CSS locks is its type of viewport width. So there are two problems with this. The viewport width uh, is relative to the viewport, not necessarily the container that you're in. And also, you might be wanting to do things, uh, you might be wanting to make things fluid that are not relevant to length. So viewport is a length measurement. And uh, font size uses length measurements, but vari variable fonts do not use length measurements. And so I developed TypeTrue.js to help solve this problem. 
problem. And what typeterror.js does is it maps CSS keyframes to a width or some value. And so let's look at that. Here's that same example, but mapped to keyframes instead of using CSS locks. So using custom CSS properties, I'm going to tie this to the body keyframes, set a maximum of 800 pixels, and the only math you have to do here, you do have to do a little bit of math, of math still, uh, 400 pixels, our lower boundary, uh, is half of 800, so that's at the 50% keyframe. And I can use any units that I want to here. So I could scale from rems to pixels. So the rems are defined here. And because it uses the CSS animation API, it uh, can translate those two. I can also translate, uh, sort of restrict this to uh, its container instead of uh, the viewport. So this is already sort of inside the article with a class of type hero, which adds the custom properties to the top. And if I constrain this max width, I constrain the width to 50%. Now this is based off of that parent container as opposed to the viewport. This is an example. <laughs> it's uh, a little bit abstract. So what would this look like in practice? A lot of us have home pages with lots of different articles on them. And what would happen if all if all of our H1s, if all of our sort of supporting copy had the exact same styles. So it might look like this. Here I have the root styles. So this transitions between various uh, font variation settings. So I can go back here and check that out. So transitioning the font variation setting instead of, uh, instead of the font size. You could see that in, that, you could see that in this example here. And as I resize, each individual element is fluid by itself. And part of what we did with typechero.com <laughs> is to create a tool that helps you do this a little bit easier. So you can change your settings here, as we did before. And as I scale between them, all of this is fluid by default. So I can have my font size be five rounds here. Change my weight. Width, and then as I go to a smaller size, change my weight, width, Quickly, I have a fluid type graphic system. So thanks so much for having me. <laughs> thanks to WordPress and WordCamp. Uh, thanks to Onotype Company for uh, supplying, obviously, uh, Sal and Anna for help with the presentation.
here are a number of uh, links, Vectura, uh, modular scale, uh, CSS logs, uh, responsive web type is a really great resource um, from Jason Pemethal. I recommend, uh, let's see, there, there are two different approaches to that. If you want to uh, have a consistent, uh, what's called baseline grid, then you will want to keep your line height consistent between the two. Uh, but the line height on the sidebar is probably going to be a little bit too wide. Uh, so, I personally probably set it up so that they're slightly different in either place, uh, so that that sidebar has its own sort of uh, logic that makes the text slightly smaller, uh, makes the line height slightly smaller. Uh, but both approaches are valid uh, in different ways, as you can see with. This example here, uh, the body copy is the same throughout, uh, and that line height is also preserved. Uh, so I, I did preserve the line height in that example. Uh, and with body copy, I think you tend to want to have a little bit more of a preservation of that line height, whereas with other copy, uh, the variation. I know 16 pixel font size is preferred. Uh, that just doesn't work on like watch sizes <laughs> or anything smaller than a phone. Uh, so while it doesn't tick that checkbox of accessibility, uh, I definitely do recommend getting to 16 pixel font size as soon as possible. Uh, but uh, I think the spirit of accessibility is to like make it legible, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I definitely do recommend it to 16 pixel equivalent as soon as possible. Uh, but yeah, there are just cases in which that's not realistic. Yeah. So there's a lot of really cool examples um, around art direction with like variable fonts. What about UI? So aside. From uh, yeah, uh, digging into the archives a little bit. <laughs> uh, so you might have like a departure or arrival thing. Uh, so this uses a typeface called Decora, which is very much for us. Um, what is this? Uh, Zycon. And so Zycon is all of these kind of dingbats that are uh, that are animated. So all of these, it has a number of variation axes uh, that allow you to transition things. And one of those axes might be around time. So as I change the time, I can see the clocks changing here. And as you can see, as I hover over things, that, that kind of is a little bit nicer than it's just snapping the bolt. Uh, here you can see uh, this bridge is 200 meters long. Uh, but I'm using Tangle.js. And as I sort of change that, the bridge that I have defined here can change based on the, uh, the attribute that I have given it. 
so yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff that you can do with variable fonts. Um, I'm personally like super interested in like what you could do from an editorial standpoint. Uh, how do you increase legibility with them? Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot you could do. Uh, there's uh, Mandy Michael is a really good person to follow if you're interested in the art direction side of variable fonts. Uh, and yeah, there's there's certainly examples for uh, for UI as well. Yes. Are there a lot of these fonts out there? And are any of them free? How much do they cost? Where do you find them? Yeah, there are a lot of free ones. Uh, the one that I've used throughout this talk, obviously, uh, the name of it, <laughs> uh, is not. Um, but there's a great website called vfonts.com. And it's a really good list. A lot of them are free. Uh, some of them are paid. Uh, but if you're looking for variable fonts, this is a really good resource. Uh, you might, knowing a little bit of CSS certainly helps. Uh, the, yeah. It's a little bit simpler, I think, than using other fonts, uh, because when you're using the app font face declaration, you're just including one font as opposed to multiple fonts. Uh, and that's really helpful in terms of load time as well, because you're just loading one resource instead of multiple resources. Uh, so the app font face declaration is a lot simpler to use uh, with variable fonts than with uh, not variable fonts. With uh, uh, sort of the other aspects of variable fonts, so let me pull up this demo. Uh, the only kind of gotcha is that font variation settings map to width, uh, slant, and other attributes. Uh, that's a lot different than, say, using uh, bold or italic. The uh, San Francisco by Apple maps very well to the weight. Uh, if you change font weight and then use a number, you can transition between those really easily, so they've done a really good job of mapping those font variations to the font weight uh, attribute. But uh, yeah, it's this is kind of the other difference of using variable fonts as opposed to standard fonts. Yeah. So do you have any control of how wide it goes or how narrow it goes, or is it just sort of built into the font? Have you never used one? There are limits to how wide or how narrow you can go. So the width, obviously, uh, the limits are set up. Sorry, I went all the way back. Are set up here, uh, and these sliders are set to those limits. Uh, Firefox has a really good web inspector for very font variation settings, so you can see down here, if you select an element that has a variable font, you can uh, see what the maximum value is, so the maximum of 800, minimum of 100, so it's the exact same sliders that I have up here. Uh, yeah, their, their web inspector is fantastic for variable fonts. I missed the first like five minutes, did you discuss browser support or the commitment for uh, the newest um HTML for supporting this technology? Browser support is, I did not. Oh. <laughs> uh, and browser support is good. Uh, it's uh, Internet Explorer, or sorry, Microsoft Edge supports it. Uh, but uh, it tends to be based on the OS you're using as opposed to the browser you're using because the text rendering engine happens in the OS itself. So uh, if you're on sort of newer Microsoft products, they have rolled out support for it. I'm not sure exactly what version of Windows, Windows 10 
shipped with variable font support. Uh, and I think it's High Sierra that shipped with uh, variable font support. Is it very mobile friendly, I assume? Then? Yes, yeah. We love using uh, Photoshop to make mockups. Uh, what what uh, is it? Can we use some of these variable fonts in Photoshop or other other than mockup tools? The Adobe Suite now supports variable fonts, so you can mock stuff up with variable fonts in Adobe products. Uh, I think the hard part with any artboard-based design tool is that you can create artboards or sort of static Photoshop mocks, uh, but transitioning between, it's, it's really difficult to show how things transition between those different artboards, those different screen sizes that you do mock up. So yeah, having that conversation with your developers is uh, difficult because we don't have the language or the tools to really show that. Yes? I have a very basic question. Why do typographers hate comic songs? I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so I actually think it's a very good font. Uh, and that might be. Are you allowed to say that? Uh, yeah. uh, I think that typographers, type designers tend not to hate it. It is a very well designed font. Typographers hate it because it is used poorly in almost all situations. Uh, and, you know, if you see it on sort of any kind of legal paper, uh, <laughs> street signage, uh, it, it will definitely make a typographer cringe, and it is often used that way. If it is used for a daycare center, then that's fantastic. Uh, it was originally created by Vincent Conair for Microsoft, Microsoft specifically, uh, which was a very cartoony computer interface. And it suits that use case very well. It was well designed for that use case. And uh, it, the typeface itself gets a bad reputation, but uh, I, yeah, it's uh, used poorly. same way. <laughs> uh, drop caps are particularly uh, interesting to work with. Uh, a lot of times uh, as web designers we use initial letter, or sorry, first letter, uh, the pseudo class to call that and then style it. So uh, calling that and then making it float and then having the font size be bigger. Uh, with, to, to sort of create that drop cap. Uh, there is a CSS spec for initial letter, which fixes all the sort of scaling issues uh, for drop caps, but it has zero browser support. So uh, that, that would be ideal. Uh, uh, Ethan Marcotte, who is speaking at this conference later, wrote a really good post on the Fox product blog uh, about all of those issues. Time's up, so uh, if you have any more questions, you can see me later. <laughs>